Hello everyone and welcome to USMLE Step 1 High Yield Images Part 2. So this is the second video in the series. I'm using some new software now so uh, there's no more watermark fortunately and hopefully the audio is a little bit better as well. So I hope the first video was helpful. This is going to be the second one and, and let's just get started. So this is our first image and this is going to be complex spots. Uh, See it right here. These are small irregular red spots on the buccal and lingual mucosa, uh, and they have a blue white center. It can be it's really hard to see. Uh, the entire lesion itself is pretty hard to see, um, but there is supposedly a blue white center, and this is seen in measles. Uh, a couple things about measles: just remember that it's also called rubeola. Do not confuse that with rubella. Measles is rubeola. Rubella is an entirely different condition. Uh, one other thing about measles, remember it's characterized by the three C's, cough, coryza, and conjunctivitis. Those are some of the common symptoms of measles. So this next one is going to be Roth spots. These are retinal hemorrhages that have a pale center. You can see it really well in this one, a nice pale center there. Uh, and these are seen in bacterial endocarditis. In the previous video, I said that bacterial endocarditis is characterized by a lot of different high yield images and names, uh, and this is one of them. So this is going to be Roth spots. Again, retinal hemorrhages with a nice pale center. You can kind of see it here as well. This next picture uh, is of Lich nodules, and there's really nothing else that looks like this. You see all these brownish nodules here. This is a sign of neurofibromatosis type 1. A couple things about that, it's also called von Recklinghausen disease, and the gene associated with this, NF1, is found on chromosome 17. I believe in first aid it says that von Recklinghausen is 17 letters, so that's how you can remember the association between neurofibromatosis type 1 and chromosome 17. It is important to know the location for that gene. So this is Lich nodules here. The next image is going to be a Gaucher cell. And this is a lipin-laden macrophage that a lot of people say looks like crumpled up tissue paper. Um, I guess I kind of see it. Uh, so this Gaucher cell is seen in Gaucher disease. And it's really high yield to know um, some of the, the pathophysiology behind this. So Gaucher disease is characterized by a deficiency of glucocerebrosidase, and therefore it causes a buildup of glucocerebroside. Very high yield to know that, and to know those, that same information for all of the um, all of the lysosome storage diseases, as well as the glycogen storage diseases. You need to know what enzyme is deficient and what builds up. Really important to know that. So this is a Gaucher cell seen in Gaucher disease. This next one here is an example of a Kaiser Fleischer ring. You obviously see the ring around the eye right here. So these are seen in Wilson disease and this is due to a copper accumulation. Uh, and most people know that. The one thing that a lot of people don't know is that almost every time when you have this Kaiser Fleischer ring, that means that the patient has basal ganglia atrophy as well. So it's associated with Wilson disease, and when you see this, if they're asking something neurology related, you want to be thinking about basal ganglia atrophy. Very important to know that. This next one is an example of lichen planus. Uh, so when you see this, you want to remember your five Ps. I don't even think that lichen planus always resembles the five Ps, but it is important to know them. So it is purple pruritic, so it's itchy, polygonal, planar, papules, and plaques. Um, I don't always see that with lichen planus, but then again, dermatology isn't my strong field. But those are the five Ps that are associated with lichen planus. This next one is pretty unique. This is an example of Hutchinson teeth, uh, and these are a sign of congenital syphilis. So you can see these kind of hutched or notched teeth here in children. Nothing else really presents like this, and when you see something like this, you're going to want to be thinking of congenital syphilis. This next one is an example of Charcot-laden crystals. Uh, these are crystalline aggregates of major basic protein, and it's very important to know that. These are aggregates of major basic protein, which comes from eosinophils, and this is seen in bronchial asthma. 
Uh, if you watched the first video, there was another image that I showed that was also associated with asthma. Do you remember what that is? Yeah, that would be Kirschman spirals. So Kirschman spirals and these charcot laden crystals, you want to be thinking some type of pulmonology, uh, pulmonary pathology, possibly asthma. Do not confuse this with something like the um, needle-shaped crystals in gout. You'll probably be able to glean that from the question stem. Uh, but this is not gout crystals. These are entirely different. This next image, um, most medical students tend to know just because it's um, really popularly tested. This is an example of an epidural hematoma. We see it right here. Uh, and this has a biconvex or a lens shape. So you, so you can see that nice lens shape there. And it's also high yield to know what causes an epidural hematoma. Uh, and that is rupture of the middle meningeal artery. Middle meningeal artery. Do not get thrown off if you see middle cerebral artery because that is an important artery in the brain and you might think that that could cause this, but that is not the case. It is the middle meningeal artery that a rupture of it causes an epidural hematoma. This next one uh, is also pretty well known universally. It, it always comes up though. Uh, and this is an example of our rods. You see them right here. These nice rods on the periphery of the cell. Uh, and these are azurophilic granular material that is seen in AML. Uh, it's also important to note that they can be seen in CML. Um, that's not super testable, but you know, if for, if for any reason you have a picture like this and an option is AML and an option is CML, you don't want to necessarily just jump for AML. You want to take a look back at the question, Sam. Um, the epidemiology of the patient and then decide from there. But again, our odds mostly seen with AML can be seen with CML. Not very common, but it is possible. Uh, this next picture is an example of histoplasma. Uh, this is a fungus and it's seen inside um, a macrophage here. A couple important things to note about histoplasma. Uh, just for size reference, they are smaller than red blood cells. Some of the other fungi are about the same size as red blood cells or a lot bigger than red blood cells, but histoplasma are smaller than red blood cells. So we see them inside a macrophage here. Two more important things to know about histoplasma. Uh, really for any fungus, you wanna know the location. So do you remember what the location, the geographic location for histoplasma is? It's usually around the Ohio, uh, Mississippi River Valley. That's usually the, the location that they'll give in the question stem to kind of tip you off. And the other really high yield point that they'll mention in question stems is people who uh, are spelunkers or who like to go into caves or explore a cave for a field trip or something like that. If you hear something like that in the question stem, you definitely wanna be thinking about histoplasma. This next uh, image is a picture of Heberden nodes. So these are osteophytes in the distal interphalangeal joints that are seen in osteoarthritis. In the previous video, I mentioned the nodes that are seen in the pro or, yeah the proximal interphalangeal joints. And do you remember what those are called? Those are Bouchard nodes. So my way of remembering it is B comes before H, proximal comes before distal. So Bouchard comes before Heberden. That's how I remember it. So again, Heberden nodes, as you see them right here in the distal interphalangeal joint, you want to be thinking about osteoarthritis. This next picture uh, is an example of Kimmelsteel Wilson nodules. And these are a sign of nodular glomerulosclerosis that is usually caused by diabetic nephropathy. So you see within the glomerulus here, there's like these sclerotic nodules. You can't really make out any cell nuclei. And there's really nothing else, uh, no other glomerular pathology that looks like this. So if you see anything like this, a lumpy glomerulus that's all separated like this, you want to be thinking, Kimmelsteel Wilson nodules, and you want to be thinking diabetic nephropathy. This next image is an example of dermatitis herpetiformis. So th these are pruritic papulovesicular eruptions that are seen in patients with celiac disease. It is really important to know that association, dermatitis herpetiformis and celiac disease. Uh, it presents a lot of different ways. Uh, so this picture might not be representative of all of them, but this was just a really extreme case, so I wanted to use it. So if you ever hear in a question a patient that has some GI problems and they also have 
a rash, you definitely want to be thinking about celiac disease, and the associated rash is dermatitis herpetiformis. This has nothing to do with herpes. It looks like herpes. That's why it has the name, but it is an entirely different uh, skin condition itself. This next image is an example of Burkitt lymphoma. Uh, this is a classic picture, a classic description people like to give is the starry sky appearance of Burkitt lymphoma. Um, these stars are the macrophages that are seen here. Burkitt lymphoma is an extremely high yield uh, condition to know for the purposes of boards. A, a couple different things to know about it. Uh, there's an overamplification of the oncogene C-MYC. So I know in pathoma, um, it's called Burkitt-MYC lymphoma, uh, Burkitt lymphoma, Burkitt-MYC lymphoma for the amplification of the C-MYC uh, gene. Uh, the other thing that you want to know about this is the translocation, just as you do for all the other conditions. So for Burkitt lymphoma, it's a translocation of chromosome 8 and chromosome 14. So Burkitt lymphoma, translocation of chromosome 8 and chromosome 14. One other high yield point that you want to know is that it is associated with Epstein-Barr virus. There are a couple of different conditions associated with Epstein-Barr virus, and Burkitt lymphoma is definitely one of the most important ones. Next image here, this is an example of basophilic stipling. Uh, I believe I had mentioned it in the first video, so now we are actually seeing an image of it here. So these are ribosomes that are uh, being visualized inside red blood cells, these dark blue um, specks, if you will. So these are seen in two conditions mainly, the first being lead poisoning and the second being sideroblastic anemia. Uh, this is a pretty unique picture. You're not going to see a CT scan or MRI of the brain that looks anything like this. Or, and, I mean, there's nothing else that really looks like this. This is an example of glioblastoma. Uh, it's a really aggressive um, brain tumor. Most patients don't survive longer than a year or two. Um, new treatments are coming out, but it's it, you know it can have severe mass effect. It can take up a large part of the brain. It's pretty aggressive. So it's got a pretty grim prognosis. So again, you won't really see anything like this, an example of glioblastoma here. Okay, this is an example of a hyaline cast. So you definitely want to know the different types of urinary casts that can be seen under microscopy. Uh, a hyaline cast is maybe a little lower yield than the other ones. It's pretty nonspecific. One important thing to note, though, is that this hyaline cast is composed of TAM horsefall glycoprotein. Uh, and it's usually a normal finding, like I said, but it can be seen in a concentrated urine sample. So maybe someone who's dehydrated, who hasn't been drinking a lot of water, someone who's homeless, maybe doesn't have access to clean water. If you see something like this, uh, you want to be thinking it's a hyaline cast. And I believe this is going to be the last image for this video. This is an example of dew drops on a rose petal. I really wanted to include this because I had heard this term so many times throughout medical school and I never really had a clear image of it in my head because it just sounds so random, dew drops on a rose petal. But this is what it looks like. Um, for the people who have a more scientific understanding of things, if you will, um, the other way that this can be stated is a clear vesicle, clear vesicle here, sitting on an erythematous base. So dew drops on a rose petal equals clear vesicle sitting on an erythematous base. Whichever one works for you. Uh, the two primary conditions that you're going to see this with, uh, or the two primary viruses are varicella zoster and, and herpes simplex. So do drops on a rose petal, you want to be thinking about varicella zoster and herpes simplex. Okay, so that uh, concludes this video. I hope you found it helpful. Uh, you know, feel free to subscribe, leave comments, leave suggestions, anything like that. I'll definitely be uploading more videos in the future, but good luck studying, and I will be uploading another video soon.